Greetings from Boston. It's an honor to be able to speak with you today about some issues in ethics consultation. For a number of years, um, I did consultations at several different Boston teaching hospitals, two different acute hospitals, and one what we call long-term care institution. So the thoughts that I present to you today really arise from, from my experience and a lot of years of reflection. I've uh, entitled my talk, The New Futility, and clearly that suggests that there was an old futility. So what I want to do in talking to you today is to begin with a discussion of the old futility, which I would argue was a leading reason for ethics consultation in American hospitals in the 1990s, and then explain how there was gradually a shift from discussions of futility to discussions of goals of care, culminating in the early 2000s, and then argue that what we have seen recently is a new futility debate a debate that arises because of the perception that the goals of care are themselves sometimes futile, and then end with a few comments about how we might best respond to this challenge. So let's begin with the old futility. This arose because physicians felt that patients, or sometimes their surrogates, were requesting, uh, and in Ameri the American context, actually demanding treatment that the physicians believed was not beneficial. And physicians, and sometimes the hospitals where they worked, sought to refuse to provide this treatment that they regarded as futile. Uh, this process played out at the bedside. It played out in ethics consultations and it played out in the courts. If you look at published articles in the medical literature with the phrase medical futility, uh, and this is from uh, PubMed, a commonly used database in the United States, what you'll see is that in fact before 1990 there were virtually no mentions of medical futility. And beginning in 1990, peaking in the mid to late 1990s, what you see is an exponential rise in the number of articles that deal with medical futility. And after 1995 or so, the number of articles began to taper off and then plateau. So let me tell you about a simple futility case a case that uh, achieved widespread notoriety in America and led to a lot of discussion among ethicists and in the medical literature about this notion of futility. The particular case was the case of a woman named Helga Wangley. She was 85 years old and sustained a cardiac arrest after hip surgery. This left her dependent on a ventilator with markedly impaired cognition. Her physicians sought a do not resuscitate order, uh, which they did uh, get from the, the, the family, and they also sought removal of the patient from a ventilator, which they went to court to pursue. The court upheld the patient's husband as a legitimate guardian. The husband stated that the goal was to prolong his wife's life so the ventilator stayed. Uh, ultimately, despite the ventilator, Helga Wangley died, but there was a prolonged period where she remained on the ventilator. What this case led people to recognize was that there was a problem with this notion of futility. Futility truly was uh, like beauty or pornography uh, in the eye of the beholder, that the benefit of treatment surely depends on what goal it's supposed to achieve. And what we saw here was a difference in opinion between the physicians and the patient's husband about what the goal of care was. 
the physician's goal for Mrs. Wangui was to restore her to her previous level of functioning, to allow her ideally to leave the hospital. And they felt that the ventilator was not going to achieve this purpose and therefore it was futile. Mr. Wangley's goal for his wife was simply to prolong her life, which parenthetically he said would have been his wife's goal as well. And the ventilator was very successful in achieving this goal. So how could such disputes about futility be resolved? What we saw increasingly in the 1990s was that negotiation and mediation were used to try to resolve these disputes. But that what the negotiators and the mediators and the ethics consultants serving these roles increasingly did was to clarify the goals of care. Their job was to assure that the surrogate decision maker, in the Wangley case, Mr. Wangley, actually represented the wishes of the patient, that the surrogate was using substituted judgment, or if they didn't know the patient's wishes, that the surrogate was using a best interest standard. And the negotiator or the mediator or the ethics consultant or all of the above would then try to determine whether the proposed treatment, the treatment that was causing the controversy, was consistent with those goals. So let's look at an example of how this approach, this goals-centered approach, led to resolution of what on the surface appeared to be a futility debate. Take, for example, a patient with advanced dementia. And the family is requesting or demanding a feeding tube to feed her because she has a little trouble swallowing, she eats very slowly, she often pushes away her food. The physician believes that the tube is not indicated, says this is futile. But instead of being at an impasse because of this dispute, what the new model allows us to do is to try to elucidate the goal of care. And suppose that we discover that the family's goal is to prolong the patient's life as much as possible. Then what the physician does is not to dispute that goal, but simply to explain that actually uh, though it's counterintuitive, feeding tubes do not prolong life in advanced dementia. That the best way to try to maintain nutrition is with hand feeding, slow, gentle hand feeding, and that therefore a feeding tube is not indicated. Acknowledging, recognizing, and accepting the family's goal of care, and then simply saying that a feeding tube is not necessary to achieve the goal that they have stated is their most important goal. So let's move from the old futility to the new futility. And what I've suggested is that we're increasingly seeing situations in which the patient or the surrogate articulates a goal that simply cannot be achieved. Now let me give you a couple of examples. Suppose you have a patient with advanced cancer and cachexia, weakness, fatigue, related to the cancer. And the patient says that his goal is to improve his physical functioning. But the physician says the patient is dying, and that's why function is impaired, and that there is no intervention, regrettably, that can reverse this process. The patient's goal of improving physical function is simply impossible to achieve. Let's look at a different example, because this isn't all about cancer. Suppose we have a patient with advanced cardiomyopathy. And the patient says that his goal is to travel to another city in a few months after his new grandchild is born to see that grandchild. And to that end, he demands attempted cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And if he develops respiratory failure, he demands that he be put on a ventilator. And the physician says that there is no way 
that travel across the country in three months is going to be possible for this gentleman. And his argument is that if what it takes is attempted CPR, that's not going to work because it has never been successful in this situation. And if the patient doesn't have full CPR but is on a ventilator, a ventilator is not consistent with his being able to travel across country. So what I think we have seen emerge is that the goals of care paradigm has certain limits. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize that I'm not throwing out that model. I think that in general, eliciting goals of care has been a very fruitful approach to advanced care planning. It's been a fruitful approach to ethics consultations. It's been a marked improvement over the impasse that we often found ourselves in with the futility debates. But there are limits to this paradigm. Let's look at the kinds of goals that patients may have. Uh, and I would argue that there are really three major goals, prolonging life, maintaining function, or maximizing comfort. So when are these goals limited? Well, let's look at the easier ones first, maximizing comfort. We can certainly always try to maximize comfort. I think what we cannot guarantee we will succeed in doing is eliminating all pain and suffering. We can now look at maintaining function. It's certainly reasonable to consider interventions that affect function, whether it's physical therapy, occupational therapy, nutritional interventions, but it may be impossible to prevent decline in people with very advanced illness. And then the third goal that patients often express is prolonging life. And again, we can consider whether there are interventions that are likely to produce that end. But those interventions, regrettably, may in some instances, in many instances, of people, in people near the end of life, simply not exist. So how can we respond to these new futility debates? What should we do? Uh, so I'm going to throw out a few, a few thoughts for your consideration and discussion. And first I would say that we should only, in our discussions with patients and families, consider achievable goals. That it really makes no sense to ask people, is your goal, is your main goal life prolongation? And then turn around and say, too bad, sorry, can't be done. We need to offer goals that make sense given the patient's actual medical condition. So what is the role for the ethics consultant in this new world? As previously, I think ethics consultants can be helpful in eliciting goals of care. They can talk to clinicians to determine whether those goals are achievable and if the goals are not achievable, they may need to discuss with patients or families alternative goals. Sometimes this is tricky if the patients already come up with their goals. And this is easiest done when the goals have never been elicited. If goals have already been elicited and the patient has articulated a goal that's not achievable, then I think the best that the consultant can try to do in those circumstances is to reframe the discussion, to accept the existing goal, the goal that's on the table, but try to think about other ways to achieve the, that goal. So for example, with our gentleman with advanced cardiomyopathy who wanted to travel cross country to see his new grandchild in three months, if his goal was to stay alive long enough to witness the birth of that grandchild, perhaps it would have been satisfactory, sufficient to be maintained even on a ventilator long enough for the child to be born and then to see pictures, a video like we're using today uh, to see that new baby. 
And then another important role for an ethics consultant is to edu educate clinicians to prevent a recurrence of this kind of problem. So in summary, uh, I have presented very quickly for you today a discussion of the issue that I argue was a core issue in ethics consultations in the 1990s, futility. I've reviewed how ethicists moved beyond futility to discuss the goals of care in the 2000s. Uh, talked a little bit about the emergence of a new form of futility today and then suggested that the challenge for ethics consultants now is to recognize that goals may sometimes be unattainable, that reformulating what success means may restore, resolve the impasse, but that we also need to educate clinicians about goals of care discussions to try to prevent this uh, from happening again. So I thank you for your attention and I hope that this stimulates some discussion amongst all of you, and I hope that this indeed is a relevant consideration in, in Singapore as well as in the United States.